that you are here. Um, we have a couple of well, good morning or good afternoon, Church in the Valley. Um, welcome to CIV online and at home and in person. We are so glad that you can join us to today and are happy that you are here. Um, we have a couple of announcements. As you know, it is February, the month of love, and as we celebrate love, we also want to explore relationships and what it means to interact with those around us. So come and join us online on Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. and join us in um, just some refuel time as we pray, as we fellowship, as we study the word, and just get to know more about prayer and relationships and our relationship with God. Um, also, if you are um, in a relationship, if you and your husband, or if you and your wife, or you and your partner, or if you're looking into a future relationship, don't forget to check out some videos that we'll be posting every Friday. Um, we just posted our part two of What Happy Couples Know, so make sure to check that out or send a DM or send a private message to Church in the Valley or one of us, and we can totally set you up to join us in um, these studies. Um, without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Alexa as we prepare for worship. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Let's all get ready to worship. Let's be able to be in a space where we can just praise God for what he's done. As we sing these songs, let's reflect on how God has just made our lives so much fuller, so much greater.
surrounded to be loved by you God Lord you have just made a way for us Lord you have made possibilities possible Lord you have made the impossible possible God I pray as we reflect on the message Lord as we reflect on our week our lives Lord I pray that you will bless us God you will give us this newfound light Lord for learning of your endless love your abundant love God amen Hey, well, good morning, CIB friends and family, and thank you again for joining us for an online and at home uh, worship experience. Uh, we're, we are in a series of messages looking at the various relationships that we have in our lives. And here at Church in the Valley, we believe that relationships matter because God values relationships. We like to say it this way, love God passionately, love each other sacrificially, and love each other compassionately. And so we want to take this time to examine, again, the various relationships that we have in our lives. And uh, we're using the book of Ephesians chapter 5 and 6 as the template for our relationship. Again, we believe that uh, no one was intended to do life alone. And during this pandemic, you know, oftentimes we are finding ourselves isolated. And for a time being, that can be okay. In fact, we, we need times of isolation, but we were never intended to do life that way. We were intended for community. We were intended for each other. And so again, I want to encourage you to, to journey with us as we look at Ephesians 5 and 6 and we explore the various relationships uh, that are connected to us. A few weeks ago, we talked about uh, how mutual submission, again, emphasis on mutual submission, that it's a requirement on both parts of the, 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 the party uh, in order for us to, to move our relationships forward. And last week, my wife joined me on stage uh, on Valentine's Sunday as we talked uh, kind of practically about the relationship between a husband and a woman. And, and we believe so strongly uh, in strong, godly marriages that, that we invested in our couples. And we want you as couples to join us on this 
virtual Bible study session, uh, the conference that we are doing called What Happy Couples Know. You can still join. It's not too late. Just let us know if you'd like to be a part of that. Uh, we've included all of that on our Facebook page. So the videos are there. We even have um, a downloadable link so you can have a PDF. But we believe so strongly that God desires your marriages uh, to be a reflection of the relationship of Jesus and his church. And so that's why we are investing in this. And, and we pray that you also would invest and you would take an hour out of your week. And I, I tell you that this will you know, bring great rewards, not just in your marriage, but in your family. You'll just see everyone flourishing as we work together in strengthening our relationships. Well, today, uh, we don't want to leave that conversation completely. Uh, I want to look today specifically at the men in our church. I want to talk about Ephesians chapter 5 and, and how the Apostle Paul takes this time to address the men. And I want to, I want to let you know something. I think you CIV men are some of the most amazing men that I've come to know in my life. Uh, you are hardworking. You sacrifice for the, the family. You demonstrate love uh, beyond anyone else I can ever, I, I know. And, and so you've inspired and encouraged me to be a better man. And so I thank you guys for, for locking arms with me. And I pray as we move forward that we would continue to, to grow stronger as, as godly brothers in, in the Lord. So again... Uh, today, uh, I, I'm, I'm not that it's only for the guys, but I'm specifically talking to the men and, and maybe women. You want to go ahead and take notes so that you can go ahead and remind your husbands. Uh, but you know, you guys out there, uh, it's going to be applicable to everyone on um, some way, shape, or level. And so, uh, I encourage you again uh, to, to come on in. I've entitled this message simply "Huddle Up," talking to my boys. Yeah, uh, years ago I used to play football. I know it's hard to believe that now, especially as I'm limping. Wherever I go, uh, but I loved football. It gave me the um, freedom to hit people and not get in trouble, right? But one of the things that we would do in football, unlike the other sports, uh, is that we would huddle up. Uh, it was such a team sport that we constantly needed to, to huddle up in a circle and, and we would put our heads together and someone would run off the field uh, giving us instructions from the coach and say, this is what we need to do for this next play in order for us to either stop the offense or at least to advance the ball if we are the offense. And so we would huddle up and they would say the play and then we would break and then we'd go off to our positions. So today, it's kind of like me talking to you guys and saying, yo men, huddle up. We have a game that is at stake here and we need to receive instructions from the Lord how we can win this game. And here's the thing, it's not only a game, but it is a war. It is a battle. As we talked about last week, there are just so many challenges that, that marriages are facing. And so today, I really want to dial things back I want to address them, and if I could see you guys in person, I'd be doing one of these high fives, or a chest bump, or just something to let you know that I am rooting for you. I am for you, just as, as Jesus loves you and is for you. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and, and turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Uh, we'll start in verse 25. It says this, Husbands, love your wives. Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body. But they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery. But I am talking about Christ in the church. However, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must Respect her husband. Well, next week, I've invited Din Din to kind of address that last portion uh, of this passage. And she'll address the women. And, and men, you can go ahead and take notes and remind them of what they learned next week. But, but here in Ephesians chapter 5, we see this beautiful picture. And at the same time, a very intimidating proposition for any Christian husband. 
God tells us that our relationship with our wife is so much more than just any human relationship. Wow. So marriage is a symbol of the relationship between God and his people, his bride, his church. And as such, we as men have the awesome responsibility, the solemn responsibility of reflecting, of modeling Christ's love towards his people in our relationship with his wife. Now, I'll tell you something. When, when I first began just unpacking this in my own life, you know, at first I thought to myself, oh man, you know, it's, it's always about the guy being, you know, ridiculed for not being enough. And no guy likes that. No guy likes to ever be told that we're incompetent. No guy likes to ever be, be told that we're never good enough, right? I mean, who likes to hear those kind of words? But here in this passage, we see that it's not about us being incompetent. But it's us reflecting Jesus. Now, of course, this doesn't make sense to you if you're not a follower of Jesus. But when you begin to understand what Jesus Christ has done for you, what Jesus Christ has done for, for humanity and how, how incredibly beautiful he is, then it begins to make sense. And now we have the privilege and the, the, the responsibility to reflect that kind of love to our wife. Again, the problem is, you know, oftentimes we are transactional, we're unconditional. We want something out of it. But again, when we see this passage, we realize that because Jesus initiates this love, the church responds to Jesus in love. And likewise, husbands, we need to initiate that relationship with our wives. We need to initiate that love. So the question is, you know, how? How does Christ love the church? And what does that look like in the context of marriage? As, as I read this passage, I see three qualities or characteristics of Christ's love that ought to be reflected in the way I love my wife. And here's the first one. Number one, Jesus loved sacrificially. Jesus loved sacrificially. Therefore, I am to love sacrificially. Therefore, husbands are to love sacrificially. When we think of Christ's sacrifice for the church, we immediately think about the cross. The picture of the cross, once a symbol of suffering and shame, is now the symbol of Christianity, which embodies the love of God for his people. Again, look at verse 25. It says in the NCV, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Jesus loved you so much that he literally gave his life for us. He chose to die on the cross to win our hearts. And again, that, that's the example of, of what we as husbands are to do. Now, how do we apply that? Now, I doubt if any of us you know, will ever be called to literally die for a while. Maybe one day, you know, someone might, 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 you know, uh, do that. But, but how in our everyday can we love our wives sacrificially? Again, sacrificial love will look different in every marriage, but it will always involve giving of yourself for your wife. Listen to the story I came across. Um, it's, it's a story of sacrificial love. Uh, and it goes like this. In, in the fourth year of his layoff from his job, dad gave mom a dishwasher for Christmas. You have to understand the magnitude of this gift. Our old house had its original wiring and plumbing and, and neither could handle the required installation of a, of a big dishwasher. There was no spot in the small kitchen for such a large appliance and we hadn't even been able to meet the mortgage interest payments for over six months. How in the world could we afford a dishwasher? But dad hated the thought of washing dishes. He would rather do anything else. And mom had undergone major surgery that spring and found it difficult to do any work requiring the use of her arms. No large box appeared. No new plumbing or wiring was installed. No remodeling of the kitchen occurred. Rather, a small note appeared on a branch of the Christmas tree handwritten by dad for one year i will wash all of the dirty dishes in this household 
everyone. And he did. He really did. Now again, sacrificial love will look different in that marriage, in every marriage. But for this man, this was an act of sacrifice. Put simply, sacrificial love is about putting your wife before yourself. Here at CIV, hard attitude number one, which is which are our relational values as a church, simply stated is this. We put the goals and interests of others above our own. Sacrificial love is about putting your wife before yourself. Life after marriage is not about me. It's about we. Can I say that again? Life after marriage is not about me. It's about we. And that can mean a lot of things. That means sometimes you sacrifice the need to be right. There are times when you just know you are right and your spouse is wrong. And we want to prove that, don't we? We don't like to be uh, over, you know, treated as if we didn't know. And, 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 and you, can, um, you can't do that without hurting the other person. You know, as one person once said, you can either be right or you can be married. <laughs> you can't be both. That may mean sacrificing sleep. Yeah, this might not seem like a big deal to most people, but anyone who's had a newborn in the house knows how important sleep is. And there are times when your spouse needs you to go and take care of the baby. And so that's what it means to sacrifice. Or perhaps it means sacrificing that, that trip that you want to go to so that your wife can attend something that's important to her. Or it may mean you just having to give up a hobby, right? Because it's too expensive and the, the family and the needs of the family are more important. Again, the examples are endless. What is it that God is asking you to sacrifice in order for you to demonstrate love to your wife? Now, the beautiful thing is Christ's love for us, for the church, is without limits. Nothing is held back. But when you sacrifice for your wife, it tells her that she is important to you. It shows her that you love her. But sacrifice is just the first characteristic of Christ's love. It doesn't end there. In fact, that's just the beginning. Secondly, we are called to a sanctifying love. Jesus' love for the church is not only sacrificial, Jesus' love is also sanctifying. What does that mean? Well, it means that we are to not only give up our lives for our wives, but that we are also to ensure uh, that she is being brought closer and closer to Jesus. The second half of the verse puts it this way. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean. Washed by the cleansing of God's word, he did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. This is what Jesus Christ does for the church. And if we are to love the church as Jesus Christ loved the church, we are to do the same thing as Jesus did. Jesus died so that you and I could have a meaningful relationship with God, so that we could become holy and righteous in his eyes. And likewise, we as the head of the home, as the husband, are called to lead our, our wives, our family, closer and closer to Jesus. Guys, your wife needs to know uh, that you love her like that. She needs you to be the spiritual leader of your home. Far too many men in the church have abandoned their role as spiritual leader. It's okay that you know the the, the, the mother and the, the children go ahead to church and you know and take take responsibility for them. And and and, and yet we see, as instructed through the scripture, that it is the man's responsibility to sanctify and bring our family closer to Jesus. Your number one goal as a husband should be the spiritual vitality of your family. Your number one goal as a father should be the spiritual vitality of your family. Think about the very husband and wife in the Bible. Way back in the Garden of Eden, Adam had one job, protector of the garden. That was his job, but he failed. He fell down on the job. You know how I know that? Because the Bible says that when Satan tempted Eve with the forbidden fruit, look at this, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband and years the clincher who was with her. You see, Adam was given the responsibility to explain to his wife the consequences of taking part of the forbidden fruit. 
But instead of telling his wife the consequences, which is death, by the way, and separation from God, instead of telling uh, you know Eve the consequences, he just sat there and watched her. Now we can, of course, you know, you know, you know color it in and and begin to extrapolate some ideas. But but maybe Adam was just looking at Eve, and he was saying, "Okay, oh, fine, do what you want to do. Let's see, maybe God will kill you." <laughs> I don't know all the details of it, but the fact remains, Adam was responsible for guarding his wife, which he didn't do. He watched her disobey God, and he did nothing. Adam should have stomped on the head of that snake the second it started talking. Adam should have grabbed that snake by the, the, the neck, whatever it's called, and just began squeezing it. But he didn't. He just watched his wife fall into sin. And when God brought that, there to, brought that to their attention, Adam blames his wife for the whole thing. Well, this woman you put in the garden, she's the one that caused all of this. Adam acted like a coward. He didn't care about his wife's relationship with God. He didn't care about his responsibility to instruct the woman of the consequences of her action. And yet, far too many men are still following in his footsteps. And I have to confess that there are times, many times, especially over the last 20 years, when I've placed my goals and interests above my wife, and I have not been the spiritual leader that I should be in my home. But it doesn't take away from the fact that we are called to do that, and that is our role and responsibility. Guys, if you want to start taking your faith seriously, if you want to start growing in Christ and leading your family in the same direction, it can totally change the climate of your marriage and your home. It can save a troubled marriage or take a good marriage and make it great. If you're not sure where to start, just start by praying together with your wife. Prayer is a powerful thing. Prayer not only opens communication between you and God, but it bonds you together. A study was done, and it's so funny that we even had to go look at statistics, right? But it showed that out of 657 married couples, they found that couples who pray together daily have a significantly lower divorce rate than those who didn't pray. Wow. You know, it wasn't simply about just going to the marriage counselor or watching, you know, some silly rom-com or going out on a date night. It was so much more simpler than all of that. It was simply inviting Jesus into the marriage relationship, husband and wife holding hands, coming together, couples praying together, saying, we need you, Jesus. You see, praying together as a couple encourages unity. It promotes intimacy and most importantly, it invites Jesus into your relationship. It is an attitude of humility where you both come before God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and you're saying, we come before you as your children. Now, if you really love your wife, you will guide her and lead her out of sin and into a life-altering relationship with God. Sanctifying love wants you to be the best you possibly can. Finally, in addition to sacrifice and sanctification, Christ loves us with a sensitive love. Christ loves us with a sensitive love. Jesus' love for the church involves sensitive care. Christ's love, as Paul puts it this way in Ephesians 5.28, Husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. No one hates his own body, but feeds and cares for it just as Christ cares for the church. We try to take care of our body. <laughs> we give our body what it wants, what it needs, food, clothing, comfort, recreation, relaxation, rest, which we all need. We're attentive to our own bodies, concerned with the needs. We are sensitive and responsive to whatever our bodies need. But this is the kind of love Paul commands husbands to also show their wives. It's uh, sacrificial, it's, it's sanctifying, but it's also a sensitive care. Basically, her needs or desires are things that we need to be cognizant of. 
This is the kind of love Paul commands husbands to show their wives. Uh, whether it's financial, physical, emotional, or spiritual, it must receive your full attention. In this way, you can love her and you can provide for her just as much as you do for yourself. Listen to these five uh, needs that, that the Dr. Willard Harley suggests or identifies. And of course, these are very, these are very, uh, it could be more than this, it could be less than this, but here are, are, are women's five most basic needs in marriage. Uh, and if there's anything that the, you get today, if there's anything that you take away from this, this talk, uh, this, this should be it. Number one, affection. To most women, affection symbolizes security, protection, comfort, and approval. Vitally important commodities in her eyes, husbands can show affection in numerous ways. A hug, a greeting card, a bouquet of flowers, an invitation to dinner, holding hands, opening doors, talking a walk together, taking a walk together, or just saying or texting the words, hey, love you, babe. Conversation. Your wife needs you to listen to her. All right, guys, we're not so good. I'm not so good at just simply listening. But men and women are very different in this area. Men typically talk only when they have something to talk about, which I guess I have something to talk about all the time. But women, on the other hand, talk in order to express their feelings and, and draw closer to the other person. That's why an average phone call for a guy lasts 30 seconds. On the other hand, the average phone call for a woman lasts 30 minutes. Isn't that interesting? Thirdly, honesty and openness. Woo, she needs you to trust. She needs to trust you completely. If a husband does not keep up honest and open communication with his wife, he undermined her trust and erodes the relationship. Four, financial security. She needs you to provide for her. This may not sound politically correct, but it is biblically correct. The Bible commands husbands to provide for their families, and in so doing, we provide our wives with a sense of safety, security, and stability. It doesn't mean that the man has to make more money than the woman. That's not what makes a man. But there is a sense that, as a man, we are ensuring the protection of our family, specifically the finances. There isn't a division. There's always open and honest communication. Number five, family commitment. She needs to know that your family is a priority, whether that means sharing meals together, going to church together, playing games together, or reading. She needs you to be a good father, to be present. Now these five, as I said earlier, are common to most women, but they're not necessarily universal. But the best thing you can do to become more sensitive to the needs of your wife is to simply ask her, how can I meet your needs? Discovering how to identify and meet your wife's most important needs will deepen your love for her and make you irresistible to her in the process. Now these five uh, things I've shared with you can seem really simple. Uh, and yet we don't do them as much as we should. Or perhaps we, we, we look at you know, what it means to love as Christ loved. Sacrificially, even sanctifying it. And we look at those two expressions of love and we're like, wow, that's hard. That's impossible. Yeah, you're right. It is absolutely impossible in your strength. Now, most men, if you're like me, we don't like to ask for help. We like to fix things, solve problems. But this is one area where you absolutely need the power of the Holy Spirit every day to help you to grow to be the husband and the father that you need to be for your wife and to your children. It is impossible. But with Jesus, all things are possible. And today I want to encourage you to begin thinking deeply on the things that we've shared. The scripture is clear. God's plan is for lifelong monogamous relationships, marriages. God desires that we stay together. It is absolutely painful when there is a separation. But it begins with what Jesus and what Paul instructed through the life of Jesus. Sacrifice, sanctification, and sensitive love. By loving your wife as Christ loved the church, you honor Jesus in the most direct and the most graphic ways. You become the embodiment of Christ's love to your own wife. You become a living example to the rest of your family. 
and a channel of blessing to your entire household. And again, like I said earlier on, you just don't even know the far-reaching impact that will have on generations to come. So today, men, huddle up, my boys, we can do this by God's grace. Today, I invite you to embrace Jesus' love. You're going to do this in your own strength, but we can do this because of God's strength. But we can also do this because of God's example. And today, if you've not received the love of Jesus in your life, if you've never experienced it fully, today you can simply give your heart to Jesus. You can open up your life and say, Jesus, I, I need you. I realize that I can't do this on my own. I realize that I've tried and I've fallen so short. But today, would you come into my life? Would you help me? Would you guide me? Would you direct me? Would you forgive me? I want to be a, a godly husband that reflects the love of Jesus. I want to be a godly husband, a father to my children that reflects the love of Jesus. Help me in these areas. I pray and ask that, that you would continue to grow in your love for God. If you ever want to reach out to me, shoot me a message, reach out to our church. We'd love to connect with you, pray for you, pray with you. We want you to know that you're not in this alone. We were created for relationships. Father, we thank you again for the simplicity and yet powerful, profound truths of this passage in Ephesians. That Jesus loved the church. Jesus loves the church to the point where he would sacrifice his life. How he demonstrates his desire for us to grow deeper in him but also how he cares for us as a shepherd cares for his sheep. Lord, help us to be that kind of husband, father, man. I pray for the men of our church and those who would be listening, God, that today they would receive your grace to take one step forward in the right direction. Oh God, would we see marriages changed? Would we see families transformed? May we see you glorified. For it's in the powerful name of Jesus we pray and ask all these things. Amen. Amen. Possible, Lord, you 